expected. And then you have to go get your taxes. You have to go in one spot and still come back there at noon and work. They're so proud of me. And it's like, well, yeah, I, I like that. Nick's a believer in Nick those things. I don't expect anything out yet. And the other guy's not a believer is what Nick is. And he's from, he has a church somewhere in Des Moines. He goes to the Pentecostal church and knows of me. And it's just so neat that he's such a deep believer. And I just combined with Nick so much. And he says, man, you're okay. And I said, yeah, I have to get my social security card, get this stuff taken care of. Otherwise, I'd be, be missing jazz band at 5 o'clock. You know, go to 5 o'clock tomorrow, miss jazz band. Couldn't get over there. And she'd be coming to my house and able to get that done. And then if they didn't have social security card, they <coughs> made it worse. And it's like, got me an opening so that I can get that stuff taken care of. And if you can't, you, know, you don't get that taken care of. You won't get your taxes. They're getting real strict on that stuff. Been just anointed, just enough to calm me down all day today. And it's like it's been hard to do, but still, I made it to church and all this stuff is happening. Like, it's God still there. And it means so much to me. Mm -hmm. So, being in my house, where we were anointed, and he finally, you know, to play drums right, showed my drum teacher, and then said, Well, you were holding his hips too tight. And then to ask really asked questions rather than me just getting all persuaded and wondering why I'm not playing the way I should be. And really put it in God's hands and just uh, I'm just so thankful that there's a merciful father and I'm glad that you you're such a, a worship leader and such a mentor of women and all people in this church and it's a big honor to have you up there. Praise the Lord. Really Amen. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um I just want to this is more of a, a request for, for the ladies of the church. Uh, if you can pray for my wife because uh, I feel like you as married women understand what her needs are more than I do when it comes to what God said about marriage I mean I'm still going to pray for her but I don't know I see her going down this path that there's this dark cloud covering her and she refuses to see anything around her and, and I don't want anything bad to happen to her so if you can pray for her and, and Stand in the gap and you know, see what happens. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Um, just feeling for them to go send for one test just to get everything okay, then they come up with another test they have to do, and another test they have to do, and it's just garbage. That's the way it works. Last week, they there was some respiratory issues. There was a minor uh, signs of a heart attack, but she seems to be doing fairly well. Um, believing in her healing. Uh, also, her son, my uncle, who's four years older than me, was diagnosed with cancer. He's been smoking since I was a, we were all little, and uh, so that's chasing him down and praying for healing on it. At the same time, they went and did some more scanning on him last weekend and found two golf ball sized tumors in his brain and they don't even know if they can even touch that with this other stuff going on because uh, you know being in an operable situation health wise for him so right now they're trying to slap a three to five month lifespan on him right now so um, we're believing in miracles we're believing in healing so just need people stand with us she's facing right now for her freedom uh, to be set free of things and uh, provision for 
prefer Mark and Zach at this point in time. Can I ask for prayer for the women's group? Um, we've been having to stand a little bit um, when, when Jordan's been out, and I think that for the first Sunday I was in briefing, and then we were able to the sisters yet. So um, just be in prayer for our ladies. Um, I don't want to just add one more thing to the list of things to do, but um, if there's interest, if there's a need, if there's a desire, we absolutely want to get together. I'd be happy to, to pray Bible studies and, and start meeting there, whether it's socially or whether
Lord, make us a living habitation. A walking, breathing kingdom, Lord. The flame that you have put within us, Lord. Let it not hide inside no longer, Lord. Let the fire of your presence that is deep down in our bones, Lord, shine for your glory, Lord, that the earth and that the world may know who you are, Lord, for your glory, Lord. Let us be like that burning bush, Lord, that does not consume our spirit, that it go and may consume our flesh, Lord, but that's okay. But we need you, Lord. Fill us, Lord. Let your presence go forth, Lord, from us to a dying world.
possible where you are. Whatever need there may be here tonight, Lord, it's accessible. It's by your spirit through faith. Yes, Lord. We receive, Lord, whatever the need might be for each and every person who's here tonight. Yes, Lord. Bless them. Yes. Bless them with the miraculous presence of healing and deliverance yes. and breakthrough in every area. Yes, Lord. We receive it by faith right now. Yes, Lord. Without feeling, without emotion, simply based on what your word yes, says. Yes, and your word is the final word. Yes, Lord. In every situation and every circumstance. Yes. We stand on it now, the rock. Yes. Your word, you said, it's like a rock word. It will not be moved. It will not change. Heaven and earth may change. May disappear, but your word will stand. Your word be declared. And that word is Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In him, all things consist of exist. And by him, all things are created. And that's true to this day. Every miracle, yes. every supernatural breakthrough is in Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Woo! Hallelujah. <laughs> that goes for you too, Ron. Praise the Lord. Ron just wanted to see if I was talking in my sleep. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Appreciate Ron. Amen. Yeah. Getting involved and uh, Mike says he's doing a great job. Amen. Mike would have to tell me because I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't know good from bad, but good. I do appreciate Amen. Ron getting involved and taking it upon himself to get in, in the mix. Amen. For what God's <laughs> doing. Amen. No pun, no, no pun intended. Praise the Lord. <laughs> All right. God is good. For those of you who just got that, you know. Soundboard, the mixer up there, praise God. I knew James would be right on top of it, like <laughs> white on rice there, praise the Lord. So. Okay, thank the Lord, amen. Let's get right to the word. Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 29 through 32, and I'm going to have a drink of my water. My water. Tammy may have slightly contaminated it, but it, after all, it's all in the family, so <laughs> praise the Lord. Ephesians 2, 24. Ephesians 4, verses 29 through 32, please. Thank the Lord. And we'll try to move through this as quickly as the Holy Spirit allows, so you can get home and get some rest. We want to be obedient to the Lord. Okay, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. They praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, let's go back up to verse uh, 29. What is corrupt communication? Praise God. Now, we're told not to let it proceed out of our mouth, but I guess we need to know what it is. And it's not talking about what we call curse words. Right. If it were, I was guilty on my way up to Estes Park from Fort Collins <laughs> when somebody wouldn't allow me to merge 
when I didn't know whether I was going right or left until at the last minute and realized I had to go left. He had plenty of room to back off a little bit and give me, but he wouldn't do that. And uh, so, but I can honestly say tonight that no corrupt communication came out of my mouth. <laughs> Something else came out of my mouth. Amen. But it wasn't corrupt communication. So that's not what God's calling curse words here. But, but God, in fact, is dealing with us about cursing. Any of us, that goes for you too, we're all a nation of priests, kings and priests. So when you uh, share your faith, you're preaching, you're uh, uh, prophesying. Amen? You're taking the word of God and, and sharing it with somebody else. So any of us, when we, when we do that and we use the law, we are putting people back under the curse. Yeah. And therefore, we are cursing them. It's what Paul talks about when he says, let anyone who doesn't accept this gospel be a curse. He's not, he's not cursing them. He's just saying that's the result. If, you're, if you don't receive grace, you're under the curse. Yeah. It's, a, it's a, just an automatic. Amen. So uh, we're setting people up for failure when we do that. Yes. Now, Let's look at Galatians chapter 3, Mike, uh, verses 10 through 13. We want people to succeed. We want to succeed. We certainly want our brothers and sisters in the Lord to succeed, and we want those who come to God to succeed. But we, when we are giving them law and rules and condemnation, we are setting them up for failure. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So unless you can do every single bit of it, which nobody has except for Jesus, then you're going to be under the curse. That no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. It takes no faith to live under the law. It's discipline. It's not about faith. It's a total opposite. But if you're going to operate uh, in the law, not of faith, then you have to live by those. Right. You have to keep them all. So Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So it's, it's not any great wonder then that there is so much discouragement, amen, in the body of Christ. People are discouraged. People are defeated. I mean, I, I see it all the time, and I know you do too. I'm not just talking about this particular group of people, but I'm talking about the body of Christ. It's, it's, it's horrible to see the kind of discouragement that goes on, amen, among Christians, and the attitude of, of defeatism, amen. And it's because we preach parts of the law that fit our culture, you know, that the culture is against or doesn't accept or does accept or what have you, and we call that the gospel. We preach our denominational teachings and rules and doctrines and, and our own personal uh, value systems and so on and so forth. And we call that the gospel. Amen. And what we do is disqualify the people of God and those that are trying to come to God. And we wonder why they don't draw near, as the scripture says, with a true heart and full assurance of faith. They don't draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith because they don't believe they have any right to. Mm -hmm. They've basically been disqualified by that kind of preaching and teaching. Amen? Mm -hmm. We tell them that God's mad at them. We tell them what's wrong with them. And uh, we tell them why God can't bless them. I, I hear it on the Christian television all the time. Sally just said something. Like, oh, somebody, whoever, I won't say who, is just preaching nothing but... Fear mm -hmm. and works. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I mean, it's that is the predominant teaching. Occasionally they'll throw in some grace, but they'll go right back to the fear tactics. Uh -huh. And, uh, I mean, we beat them up with rules and regulations and human ideas and uh, doctrinal teachings, you know, and we shut up their faith, amen, and then we wonder why we don't see miracles. Praise God. 
we're not seeing miracles because we have shut up faith in some areas because we've convinced people that they don't deserve a miracle. It's not about deserving. It's all a free gift. Come on. But when we teach law, when we teach rules, when we teach uh, condemnation and guilt and shame and fear, we disqualify them for the very thing that God has qualified them for. That's what Jesus did. He qualified us for all of the promises of God without us doing anything other than believing. And so let me say that this is what grieves the Holy Spirit. And this is what corrupt communication is that grieves the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. It's a worse kind of cursing than a cuss word. Yes. Yeah. Amen. It has far more impact and lasting effect than any moment of anger and frustration where you might just say something that wasn't too socially acceptable. Praise the Lord. That's the way I like to think of it because I'm very socially conscious. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. And quite sensitive. Amen. So sensitive that I feel like I'm growing women's parts right there, standing here before you. Oh, my Lord. If we preach Adam, yeah, that's a disturbing thought, but just go ahead and think on that for a little bit. Amen. Smurf on that for a few seconds. So, yeah, praise the Lord. Moving on. Uh, if we preach Adam and who we are in him, we're preaching the wrong man. Amen. No matter how much we talk about the blood and the cross, if we continue to preach Adam, sure. we're, we're preaching the wrong exactly. man. Praise the Lord. If we preach Christ and him crucified yes. and how that affected us, then we're preaching the right man. Exactly. Praise the Lord. It's the difference between saying something to a child like, uh, you worthless brat. You'll never amount to anything. Or saying to them, uh, instead, you're too good for that. You're too good of a child to act that way. That's not who you are. Now, both are correcting, but only one is edifying. And that gives them faith in which they can then operate. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. It gives them a sense that, see, that's not who I am. I did something that really wasn't good. But it's, it isn't defining me. I'm something other than that act. Amen? Amen. While the other belittles and humiliates and discourages them. Yep. Anybody ever been talked to that way? Somewhere or another? It doesn't encourage you to really be good. It encourages you to get even. <laughs> or to act out even more. It's humiliating. Mm -hmm. It's humiliating if it's a five-year-old or a four-year-old or a three-year-old. It's still humiliating. Mm -hmm. And it's detrimental. And it doesn't minister grace to the hearer. Which is what Ephesians 4.29 says. Right? Right now, I, uh, I used to go to uh, prisons, jail ministries and stuff when we were in Texas. I even went to Huntsville a couple of times. I was freaked out all the time because, man, I'm claustrophobic. And when I see them doors slamming behind you and the gates sliding and all that stuff, it's freaky. I'd been there a few times, which was to my advantage because the company that I worked for sold uh, industrial equipment to the prisons when they built trailers and different things up there. So I've been there before, but but uh, I never liked jail ministry. I mean, I knew there was a need for it, but I never liked it. It was just really uncomfortable for me. But our prisons and our jails are full of people who have been told all of their lives that they were no good, that they'd never amount to anything, mm -hmm. that they were bad, that they were inherently evil. They heard the words that were spoken over them, and they believed exactly what was said. 
and then we are surprised that they end up there. Praise the Lord. Let's look at Philemon 6. That the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Now look at this. This is almost like an oxymoron in, you know, relatively, relative to the typical kind of Christian uh, witness or, or uh, ministry. That the communication of your faith, this is how your faith is communicated. It's effectual. It's communicated in an effective way by you acknowledging the good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Not your good works, not how you know, long you prayed before and how long you, you know, fasted or anything else, but by knowing, by having a knowledge of every good thing that's in you in Christ. Mm-hmm. People sense that. It's a spiritual endeavor. It's not a natural thing. But you see, you've got to be rested in that. You have to be sure of that. You have to be confident of that in order for it to be transferred, if you will, to another person. You know, it's like uh, it's the joy of the Lord the Bible talks about is our strength. You know, if you're, it, believe me, if you really get settled in this, you're going to be a happy person. Right. You're going to have joy. Why could, how, how could you not? And people pick up on that. Mm-hmm. There's, there is a good vibration and a bad vibration. Mm-hmm. Amen? Mm-hmm. And we all know that, even though, you know, right. we're not the Beach Boys, praise the Lord. <laughs> but it's still true. We sense bad vibes. I mean, we pick up bad vibes from people in situations and circumstances. And likewise, we pick up the good ones. Yeah. We feel good in some situations and with some people not for any real tangible reason other than we just are there and it feels good to be here, you know? We have the ability in Christ to release good vibrations. Praise the Lord. (laughs) Who knew they were... But that's why there's no such thing as Christian music and non-Christian music. There's just music. And it's all creative. And any of it could be Christian. Exactly. And any of it could be other than that. Praise the Lord. But we do ourselves an injustice and the world by, you know, wanting to identify everything. This is Christian. That's not Christian. This is something and that's not. Amen. Praise the Lord. But we communicate our faith by acknowledging every good thing that's in us. Amen. Not by pointing out everything that's wrong with them or with us. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. When the law is preached, it shuts up faith. Yes. Yes. Amen. When you start, that's why I wonder. It it, it is only the sovereign goodness and grace of God that people get healed in church services. Especially when they have been just totally bombarded with all the bad that they do. And their lack of good that they should be doing. Their faith, I mean, faith becomes shut up in a situation like that and in a circumstance like that. Now, listen, we, we may have some revelation. We may have been somewhat liberated. But believe me, there are lingering effects. There is baggage that comes with that. And as much as we believe that we have, you know, been set free, uh, each and every one of us probably knows that there are moments, yea, even hours when the opposite attacks us, you know, where we don't feel like God's going to do this or God's going to do it. And all, and all of those doubts come from a lack of acknowledging all the good in us that God has placed there. If we really believe that, we would look at God and say, Abba, give me the ice cream cone. Not, please, I'll, I'll do this and this and this if you'll give me. No, I just, I just know you're going to give it to me because I'm your good little boy. Because that's, that's how you define me. Right. 
So I have a right to be healed. I, I should expect to be healed. I should expect that my finances increase, that, that I have breakthrough in every area of my life. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Amen. The whole purpose of the law was to conclude that all are under sin. So he could have mercy on all. It's a, it was a merciful thing. It was a good thing. Paul said the law is good as long as it's used for what it was intended for. Right. Amen. Let's look at Romans chapter 9. Or excuse me, Romans chapter 3. I won't read all of this. Actually, it, it, you need to read 9 through 31, but I won't, I won't take the time to do that, but we'll just read some of it. Romans 3, uh, let's start at verse 9 anyway. What then, are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Yeah. Praise the Lord. That, their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of ass is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Not talking about swear words there either. Amen. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. And all the world may become guilty before God. We might as well just do it all, Mike. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. This is what just blows my mind about the Judaizers and uh, Torah uh, people. That they just, what are they reading? Right. You know, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. <laughs> Seek first his righteousness, right? Yeah. And all the things get added. See, he says, now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Yeah. Even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. You just believe. Right. Right. Being justified freely by his grace. See that? Justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. His righteousness. Yeah. Notice, not ours. His righteousness is what does it. Being justified, excuse me. I'm sorry, can we go back? Yeah, please. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Without them. Not some of them, not any of them. Without them. Is he the God of the Jews only? He is, not also, is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Now, his point here is the reason for the law was so that everybody could be saved. Right. Yeah. So there's a, there's a common measuring stick for every, not just the Jew, for everybody. Right. That's so he could show mercy to everybody. Mm -hmm. That's the mercy of God. Otherwise, the only person who was ever going to get saved would have been a Jew. Right. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. He is the God of the Jews. Is he the God of the Jews only? He, is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes. Of the Gentiles also. Jews didn't believe that, but he's the only God there is. Right. So he's got to be the God of everybody. Right. Whether they acknowledge that or not is another thing. 
Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. In other words, we prove what the law is for. Mm -hmm. To bring us to the end of us. To move us to faith in Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Uh, let's just quickly, uh, Galatians 3, verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. That's it. It's given to them. The promise is given to them that believe. Mm -hmm. Whether they're under the law as Jews or still accountable to the law as Gentiles. So it was designed to bring us to Christ. Amen. You know, after you're, you're worn out, after you've tired yourself and exhausted yourself on the religious treadmill, and apparently that's where James is right now, yeah. helping him out, praise the Lord, of works, sweat, tears, amen, you'll run out of steam. You'll get exhausted. You'll get to the point where you just can't handle it anymore. And at that point, you'll say, I need a savior. I need somebody that can do what I can't do. Because you can't do it. Mm -hmm. That's what the law was designed to do. That was the purpose of the law. That was the intent. Mm -hmm. You know, Moses was the mediator of the law. Yep. Amen. That entire covenant of law. He, he was the mediator. He was the one who brought it. He was the one that proclaimed it. He was the one who explained it. He was the one who pronounced it. Amen. Yep. The mediator. Amen. And he didn't make it into the promised land. Nope. He didn't make it in by the works of the law. Right. Moses only messed up once. And he missed the promised land. If he had made it, now think about this, because I've looked at that a lot of times and I thought, wow, that's pretty harsh, you know. But if he had made it, you and I would forever have been destined to enter by works. Moses was a type of the law. He could not bring them into the promised land. Right. Only Joshua, who in Hebrew is Old Covenant Hebrew, is Yeshua. Mm -hmm. In the New Covenant or New Testament, it's Jesus. Yeah. Let's, let's look at this. Uh, he, he's the only one that could bring them into a true rest. Yeah. So let's look at Joshua 1. Chapter 1, verse 2. This is directly related to Hebrews uh, 4, where he talked about entering into the rest and why they didn't, and so on and so forth. And the Lord said, J Judah shall go up. No, that's not it. Oh, I'm sorry. Chapter 1, verse 1. I'm sorry. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto a land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Okay? Now, in the New Covenant, the promised land isn't a piece of real estate. It's a person. Right. It's Jesus. Amen? Amen? So when we get in him, there is an outflow of milk and honey. Mm -hmm. Amen? Jesus Christ, our heavenly Joshua, praise the Lord, is the fulfillment of all the promises of God that were made to the fathers, yes. to the patriarchs, mm -hmm. to the prophets. Amen? Amen? 
in Christ, all of God's promises are yes and amen. He is our inheritance. He is our promised land. Yes. Praise the Lord. When you're in him, you found a place of rest. Yes. They didn't enter because of unbelief, the scripture says. They didn't mix the word with faith. And it actually says when the gospel was preached to them. It was preached, but it was preached in types and shadows. And they didn't mix any faith with that promise or with those words of the gospel that was being the good news that God was giving them. And because of that, they, didn't, they couldn't enter into the rest. They didn't believe. And Paul then, in Hebrews 4, warns us not to fall after the same example of unbelief. Praise God. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3. And we'll wrap up with this. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. You were in Christ before the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. It was everything needed for you, for your life, for your uh, godliness. Amen? All that you need for life and godliness, Amen. God has provided you. Amen? Amen? So in Hebrews 4 and 3, we which have believed do enter in to rest in Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Believed what? The gospel. Amen? That is finished. That is done. That you are the righteousness of God in Christ. That you should have an expectation of good. That all the promises of God in him are yea and amen. Mm -hmm. Healing is yours. Deliverance is yours. Yes. Victory is yours. Financial freedom. Yes. In every area of your life. You already have it. Mm -hmm. yes. Amen. So don't let corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Not to you, not to somebody around you, not to anybody. Right. You know, I, if we're going to make mistakes, let's make mistakes on the side of grace. Let's err on the side of grace. God's big enough to handle it. Amen. We're so freaky. We, we think, you know, well, we, we've got a, such a fine line here, you know, that if we miss it, they might go to hell. Come on, give, give me a break. You've never saved anybody. Right. You're never going to save anybody. Right. Jesus already did everything that needs to be done. Right. All they can do is believe. And they enter into Christ. They enter into his rest. So let's not make him out to be something that he's not. Right. Let's not let corrupt communication come out of our mouth. Let's let nothing but grace and the beauty of God, the goodness of God, the kindness and the mercy of God come out of our mouth. Yes. And people will be drawn to that. And God will save them. Amen. Yes. That's, he's already done everything for them to be saved. Yes. He yes. gave us the rules and the regulations so they would come to him. Amen. So they didn't have to keep them anymore. What, how idiotic of us then do we have them come to us and then we put them back under it? When that, the thing that brought them to God in the first place has already fulfilled its purpose. Great. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. Yeah. He's a good God. Yes, Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. So the next time you curse out the guy that cuts you off and doesn't give you you know, your space that you rightfully deserve as a motorist and an American, especially a Christian, and something comes out of your mouth unnatural to you, don't feel bad. Don't worry. Be happy. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And thank God that is not the corrupt communication that the Bible talks about. Praise the Lord. Amen. See how simple it is? We make everything sin. We'll make everything a law, a rule. Anything to make you feel guilty. That's the devil. He uses the law. That's why Jesus, when he says he stripped him of his weapons and nailed him to the cross. He's talking about the law. The thing that the devil always uses is the law. Think about it. Every time he comes against you, it's with condemnation, it's with guilt, it's with failure, it's with something that you've done. He's the you little brat 
You'll never amount to anything in God. Amen? And how many people have walked out that self-fulfilling prophecy and never done what they could have done for God, never done what they could have done for others, never accomplished in themselves what God wanted to accomplish in them. I'm talking about freedom. I'm not talking about X, Y, Z on a, on a list of things to do. Right. I'm talking about being everything they could be in Christ, in that sense, meaning free, yes. not paranoid, not uptight, not freaking out, not constantly feeling like they're under pressure to be somebody that they're not, right. but just to be you and be happy with you mm -hmm. because God's happy with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is the abundant life. That's life, amen, of freedom. Yes. All the anxieties, all the stresses in our lives, we make them up yeah. based on our expectations or our supposed uh, belief that others expect from us. Mm -hmm. So who? Yeah. I mean, people are attracted to people. We call it self-confidence. We call it charisma. We call it all, all kinds of things. But the truth is, it's just people that are, are, are okay with who they are. Mm -hmm. Come on. Amen? Amen? As weird as we are, it's okay. Because yeah. you don't have to dig very deep in the person next to you to find out they are just as weird. That's what humans are. Weird. Mm -hmm. Praise God. But it's a good weird in Jesus. It's acceptable. It's acceptable. That's right, peculiar. That's just another way for saying weird. When I mean, when I see somebody say, that was peculiar, I'm just trying to say, that was really weird. I, why did they do that? You know? That's disturbing. <laughs> it's not as peculiar. Praise the Lord. God's good, isn't he? Yes, Amen. You know, with this, this is what I'm saying. This, you, you can't hardly oversimplify it. It's just that simple. Mm -hmm. It's done. It's yeah. over. Mm -hmm. It's finished. Yeah. Enjoy the benefits yes. of who you are in Christ. And let other people see that. That's the greatest witness you'll ever have. Mm -hmm. They'll sense that good vibe, that good vibration. I mean, I've got to tell you, most quote-unquote Christians that you get around, there's a lot of not-so-good vibes you're uncomfortable because you know they have an expectation that you, you know, perform up to a certain level. You look a certain way. You act a certain way. I, mean, I had my taxes done the other day, our taxes done. And I mean, I had to say, I, you know, I thought it was rather, uh, well, use a big word, superfluous for me to even say it because I know that the woman had been thinking of everything ever since I walked into the office. Although she's the same one that's done our taxes for this company for a number of years, but uh, I said, you know, I don't, I know I don't look, uh, you know, all that professional. Certainly not uh, like a pastor or a minister. Uh, amen. I'm in there in a pair of blue jeans and a, looking pretty much like I look right now. <laughs> and she just smiles, you know. She said, I, "It's not about that, is it?" And I said, "Thank you very much. It, that's exactly right." I'm not a very religious person. I like to think of myself as being spiritual because I am a spirit. I can't help myself. I'm not trying to be. That's just what I am. Right. Amen. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised how people are set at ease immediately. Absolutely. And they'll start talking about stuff you don't even want to know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But why? Because they're picking up some good vibes. They feel yeah. safe, mm -hmm. as Suzanne was saying. I can tell this guy this, and it'll be okay. He's not going to judge me. He's not going to, you know? And I get that a lot. We need to be more interested in the people around us than we are in what they think of us. True. Because a lot of times our false ideas of what we think they want to see is just that. It's false. It isn't what they want. It's what we think they want based on a religious kind of concept. What they really want is just somebody that will just be honest and accepting loving, and graceful. Amen. And people are drawn to that. That's why Jesus, they came to him by the thousands. Mm -hmm. And they were not the religious ones. They were the, one, they were the ones that, and, and, and to the religious, he didn't look religious. He wasn't religious enough. That's, that's why they hated him. That's why they didn't like him. Right. But it's the very reason that the others were drawn to him. 
Amen. That's called grace. Amen. It's a good vibration that people need it. Amen. We needed it. They need it. And God has given it to us. Amen. So let's share it. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. See you Sunday or Saturday or Friday.